Hello everybody and welcome back. Today we are going to be making this pottery tutorial that you see right here. So we're going to be basically building a custom solver that will allow us to push around this spinning pottery wheel effect and have it kind of change the shape of our clay. And then we're going to be rendering it in Karma and Material X. The sponsors of today's video is, of course, the one and only Grayscale Gorilla. They are announcing their brand new product, which is GSG Plus for everyone. So they've created importers for Houdini, Blender, and Unreal that allow you to get their materials easily into your app of choice. For us, what we're going to be doing is importing their materials into Karma and Material X. Super easy, super awesome. And uh, this is sort of what their page looks like. It's really great. And I find that when I'm kind of feeling like a lack of inspiration, but I kind of want to work on something, you open this up and look at these materials and I just instantly get ideas. Like for example, I wanted to do a tutorial where I kind of started to combine some of the ideas that I'd been covering in the MFX module series that's ongoing. I open up this app, oh, these clay materials look cool and I instantly get an idea for a pottery wheel solver that we could do a tutorial on where we transition between one of these rougher clay materials to a smoother clay material and build sort of a custom solver in the process. So I'm really excited to partner up with them and bring you this tutorial and see how we can uh, use these new materials inside of Houdini. So let's uh, dive in and check it out. If you're looking to follow along with this tutorial, I have a starter project in the link in the description below. And you'll want to just dive in there and open up this start file right here. I also have an end file, which we're going to be building together, but the end file is going to be there in case you want to check your work. I won't be able to have any materials in there, but you'll be able to check the logic of the solver and all that stuff if you get stuck. Also, there's a geo folder in here that has just a cache for the curve that we have right here. It's very specific curve and very important that we have the same curve uh, when we're working on this project because this animation is very specific to the shape that it ultimately creates. But in the end, you can change the curve and do whatever you want with it, but um, I just figured it would be important that we're all on the same page. So let's take a tour of the starter file real quick here. I'm just going to pop open the tree view. We've got here uh, two objects, which is our pottery wheel and the stick animation setup. So the stick animation setup is already done. And if we just kind of scrub through that, you can see this is the animation we're using for the sticks. And here we also have a proxy animation. So these are slightly smaller sticks so that we can easily build a collision deformer out of volume without having them take up too much space. So we're going to use this proxy animation for our simulation part, but the stick animation is what we're going to actually render. Then over here in our pottery wheel object, if we just dive in there, you can see we've got our curve, our base curve, and we've got this spinning little table for us right here. The next thing that's important to note is that we have a stage preset up here. So if I just click on this stage right here, you can see I've got our sticks being imported and our table being imported and just a little lighting setup to get us started. And later what we're going to do is actually bring in the pottery simulation and apply materials to this setup. But if I hit shift R, you can see that it switches over to Karma and we have a basic sweep and lighting setup ready to go when we're ready for that. I'm just going to hit shift R to go back to OpenGL mode and I'm going to jump back over to the object level and close the tree view and dive into the pottery wheel and we can get started. So the main concept behind how this pottery solver works is that we're going to just build something that is kind of like a collision deformer if you're familiar with Cinema 4D and then we're just going to apply it so that whatever we do with our collision deformer sticks from frame to frame. So we're going to actually build a volume and use the vo we're going to measure certain properties about the volume and use them to push around this curve. So for a simple example here, let's just turn off the template flag on the table and zoom in here and I'm going to throw it on a sphere. Sphere. And let's make that sphere the size of, let's say, about 0.15. And then I'm going to make it so I can see the curve cache by control clicking the template flag so I can bring it up here. Now let's bring the sphere up over to the side and just kind of zoom in here. So we've got this sphere and what we want to do is have it so that when we push this sphere against the side of this curve that it actually pushes the curve out of the way. And the way we can do this is using sign distance fields. So I'm going to throw down a VDB from Polygons. And if I wire this in here, this is going to create a little surface for us. I'm just going to give us some more resolution by bringing the voxel size down to something like 0.007. Seemed to be a good resolution for me. So what we're going to be able to do with this sign distance function is a few things. The first thing we're going to be able to do is determine what points are inside of the sphere. 
So what points of our curve are actually inside the sphere? And we're gonna be getting values for where we are with respect to the sphere. So positive values are gonna be points that are outside the sphere, so any of these right here. Negative values are gonna be points that are inside the sphere, and the values that they're going to give us is the distance to the surface of the sphere. That's what the sine distance function is. It's giving us a signed distance to the surface of this sphere. And the other thing we can do is measure the gradient. And the gradient of the volume is going to point in the direction that gets us to the surface the quickest. So taking the information of where we are in terms of our position in the sine distance function and the gradient of the sine distance function, we're going to be able to figure out how to push this curve outside of this sphere. So the first thing I'm gonna do is create a group. Let's throw it on a group. And this group is going to be the points that are actually inside the sphere. So in the left input, I'm going to put the curve. In the right input, I'm going to put this VDB from polygons. And let's turn that on. Now we need to switch this to, say, points, because we're actually going to be making a point group. And the group name, I'll just call that inside. And then if I turn off the base group, but turn on keep in bounding regions and switch to bounding volume, we should be able to see our points highlighted that are inside of that sphere. So if I just back out here. Oh, you can see actually that this curve only has a couple control points on it. If I just highlight it, you can kind of see that we only have about these five control points. So we're going to want to resample this so that we have like a more localized uh, point density. So let's throw down a resample. Just going to put that right here. And I'm not going to use maximum segment length. I'm going to actually use maximum segment mode and increase that to, let's say, 100 segments. So now if we go back to this group, so we can see that we've got a nice group here for all the points that are inside of this sphere. Next thing we want to do is actually run this through a VOP. So let's run a VOP, point VOP. And in the first input, I'm going to wire in our curve. And in the second input, I'm going to wire in this VDB from polygons. So let's dive into the point VOP. And here I'm going to throw down the volume sample node and the volume gradient node. And mine somehow became automatically wired up. That's good, I guess. The position we're gonna be sampling from is the current position on our curve. So we're gonna want our position to be wired in there like so. And then what we're actually gonna be looking up is the second input. So if we jump up here on the VOP, this is the second input right here. That corresponds to this little output right here, op input two. So I'm just gonna wire op input two into the file name for both of these things right here. Then what we want to do is we want to actually push this position along that gradient that we get from here by the amount that we have from here. So we need to multiply this gradient by this amount. So I'm going to throw down a multiply. And on the first input, we actually want to have the volume gradient go in first. And then we want to multiply by the volume sample because the volume sample is a scalar and the volume gradient is a vector. So I'm just going to flip these around so that we've got the, the wires are less crossed. And then if I add this to the position, so just gonna throw on an add node like this, wire in position and the result of this multiply and pipe that out through position. You can see that it kind of pushes our uh, points, but in the wrong direction. That's because our gradient is actually pointing in the wrong direction. So I'm gonna throw a negative right here. So a negate and pop that in right there. And you can see there it is pushing our points out from our sphere. So if we hop back up here and toggle this on and off, it is doing just what we we're hoping for it to do. Now this point VOP is actually working on some other points that are actually out here. We only wanted it to work on this group that we're creating, this inside group here. So we're just gonna mask off that group by making sure we select it on our point VOP. We're gonna make sure we select inside and then you can see that it puts those other points that it was messing with back where they belong. So now if I kind of back out and throw down a revolve, after the point VOP, and I'm just going to increase the divisions to 200. And let's turn off the point markers. You can kind of see that if I grab this sphere and move it around, it's starting to shape our pottery like so. Now, this isn't sticking. We want to get this to stick. So what we're going to have to do is pipe this through a solver. So let's throw on a solver. And I want to recreate everything that's going on inside this box here. So I'm going to wire in the resample into the first input and the VDB from polygons into the second input. And then what I want to do is grab all these, this, this group and this point VOP, and I'm just going to um, hit control C to copy them and then jump inside the solver and hit control V 
to paste them in here. Now these inputs that we just wired up here, this first and second input correspond to these first two inputs right here. So we can just wire this up the same way we have it up here, just inside our solver. I'm going to wire the first input here, and then the second input is going to go into the second input of the group and the second input of the VOP. And this will sort of do the same thing. You can see it causing that little bulge to happen right there. As it is right now, this isn't actually going to accumulate what our movements are until we start incorporating our previous frame and wiring this into our output here. So I'm gonna wire the output of our VOP into this out right here. That just means that everything that comes out of this out node is gonna be what is shown on the top level and also fed back in through the previous frame. So we actually need to hook up the previous frame. Now this technically works if you just wire the previous frame in here, but I like to be explicit about it because oh, old habits die hard. So I'm gonna throw down a switch node here. We're gonna explicitly say that on the first frame of our simulation, we want this switch to choose the first input right here. And then every frame after the first frame, we're gonna just feed through the previous frame in through our solver here. So we just need to, on our switch, we wanna have our previous frame in the first input and this first input in the second input of the switch. And up here, we can just write in a simple expression, dollar sign $f equals equals one. And this is just a little test that's going to evaluate to true whenever dollar sign f is equal to one. So on the first frame, you can see that our switch's second input line right here coming from input one is solid, and this one is uh, dotted. That means that it is evaluating to one. If I click on this parameter, you can see it's evaluating to one. And then if I move along to frame two, boop, it changes to select input zero, and the previous frame's input wire becomes solid. So this should do it for us. I'm gonna hop back up. Now, if I go back to frame one and click play, I'm gonna actually just give myself something like a thousand frames just to play around for right now. Project length is 400, but a thousand should be kind of fun to see what's up. So I'm going to hit play and grab my sphere and just grab this little blue box and start dragging it around. And you can see here, now we're starting to be able to shape what our geometry surface is actually doing. And I could even feed this in through the revolve and you could see it updating that revolve in real time. If I grab this and just kind of push it around, you can see we're starting to do that shaping effect that you might see like in a pottery wheel. And because we're just working on that one curve, it's pretty fast. You could actually do this by spinning this whole entire revolve around inside of your solver and get a similar result and it would be a little bit more accurate. But I figured since our pottery wheel is spinning so fast, it would be a nice shortcut just to have the extra performance to be able to play around like this. So this is kind of a cool uh, thing here. And even if you wanted some more, <laughs> this to look even cooler while you're working on it, we could just grab this transform we have from our table over here. I'm just gonna control shift and alt and drag that over. And that just gives us a reference copy that's doing exactly what this table is doing. And so if I actually just merge these two together, we'll have our pot spinning and our table spinning like so. And we can grab this sphere and push it around. So let's hit play. And if I grab this sphere and move it it's starting to already do that pottery wheel kind of effect. Now we just gotta add a little bit of polish to it. So I'm gonna just hit, uh, I'm just gonna stop that playback and go back to frame one. So let's bring in our proxy stick geometry that I had already animated for this project. So I'm gonna throw on an object merge here. And I'm going to, from this little picker right here, I'm going to select the proxy animation under our stick animation, proxy animation, and hit accept. And so we've got that in here now. And then what I'm going to do is maybe I'll just switch my template flag so that it's on that object merge. We're not looking at the sphere anymore and wire the object merge into the V to V from Polygon. So you can see that it's creating that surface there for us. And then if we go down to let's highlight our revolve, I'm going to put the display flag on our revolve and play back the animation and see what we get. All right, so it kind of looks like it did it, but you can see that we get these little areas that uh, end up like having really elongated polygons and stuff like that. And you can also see that our texture is kind of shifting around and we really want to lock that stuff down. So we're going to need to do a little bit more finessing inside of our solver to take care of that. We know that when we did this resample right here, we set it to maximum segments of 100. That's going to evenly divide the curve by 100, regardless of how long it is. We can bank on this 
inside of our solver. We just need to add this resample back inside of our solver, and that way it will update every frame. So we'll continuously get a distribution of 100 points along this curve that are all evenly separated. So we don't end up getting any weird, crazy geometry like this. So I'm just going to grab this resample and hit Control C, dive inside the solver, and after the point VOP, hit Control V, and we'll just wire that in right here before our output. Now, if we go back and replay this, let's take a look at what we get. Nice, so it's looking like our pottery has a more even distribution of polygons in it, but we're starting to see this weird kind of curve here. Do you see this kind of like little waviness inside of the geometry? And if we look at our solver, that's because when these geos come through here, they kind of push this curve off to the side. And because it's not perfectly on this, uh, what is it, the Y, X plane, it's creating this sort of warpy look inside of our geometry. So we can actually force this to stay in the uh, X, Y plane inside of our solver as well, just by adding a simple transform and scaling to zero along the Z axis. So I'm just gonna throw down a transform in here and wire that in after the resample. And what we'll do is set the scale on the Z axis to zero. That means that no matter what, if it gets pushed out, it's just gonna end up being bumped back to the zero. So let's jump out of here and watch it one more time. Now you can see that all those quads are really evenly distributed and not kind of causing any issues. You can see there's a little bit of a jump in our UVs and not only are our UVs sliding up and down this piece of geo as it's being reshaped, but then at this point, it sort of makes this judgment call and decides that the texture needs to be twice the size. I don't want any of this. I want the texture to just sort of stay the way it is. So I'm gonna just force it by UVing it after the fact. So I'm gonna throw down a UV project node after this revolve. Move all this down. And this UV project right now is currently set to orthographic. I'm just gonna set it to cylindrical and then maybe I'll grab this handle and drag it up so that's in the middle here. Next, let's just turn off the UVs for right now by hitting that button and I'm gonna just kinda go in here a little bit closer. Next up, I look at this, um, I'm seeing some kind of jagged edges in here. Uh, this is like a very sharp edge up along the top right here. And I just wanna clear that up by throwing in a little attribute blur. So right after our solver and before the revolve, I'm gonna throw down an attribute blur here and I'm just gonna wire that in so, and I'm gonna leave everything to default except I'm gonna untick pin border points. And you can see that if I just toggle this on and off, it kind of just smooths some of these edges out. Now, one of the things that happens with that is that it smooths out the first and last point and causes this little hole to appear here. So what I might do is I'm gonna put my display flag on the attribute blur and just uh, go back to frame one and then group everything but the first and last point. So you could type in group one through 99 here, or you could just manually select it by hitting this selector right here and select all the points and then hold down control and unselect the first and the last point. And then hit enter with your mouse over the viewport and then it'll type in those numbers for you up here. So the next thing I'd like to do is add a little bit of thickness here. And the node that I like to use to add thickness is the vellum post-process node. So if I type in vellum post-process, it has this nice little extrude by thickness option in here. If I highlight that and turn on extrude by thickness, you can see that um, it's actually not doing anything because we don't have a P scale. It's looking for a scale attribute to make this thickness occur for us. So we just need to provide one. I'm gonna throw down an attribute adjust float and wire that in right here and set our P scale. So instead of the operation set to add, I'm just gonna to set to set initial and set that constant value to 0.005. And that's just gonna bump out a little bit of thickness in either direction for our pot here. I would also like a little bit of roundness around this edge. So I'm gonna throw down a poly bevel after this uh, vellum post process. So I'm just gonna grab this, make some space here, type in poly bevel and wire that in like so. And if I highlight it and increase this distance by some small amount, say 0.003, you can see that it's kind of beveling everything and we don't want that. We wanna only bevel really, really sharp angles. So under this exclusions dropdown, if I open this up and say ignore flat edges and coplanar incident polygons and crank that maximum normal angle to something like 85 degrees, you'll see that it will only 
bevel that top edge right there. I just want to add an additional division to that. So let's just crank this division up to two so that it gets this nice round edge like so. And now that we're doing all this, uh, all these operations, if we go up here to our revolve and play this back, you can see things are playing back really smoothly. I'm actually having a GL error. I'm going to hit labs reset viewport. You can see everything's playing back really smoothly up here. But when I go down and do all these post processes and adding this bevel and stuff, if I click play, things start moving a lot slower. We're not getting the same frame rate that we were getting before. So right here, I just like to throw down a file cache. So after the poly bevel, I'm going to throw down a file cache node. And I'm just going to name this file cache the pottery spin cache. And I'm going to take dollar hip name out of the file name and just save a dollar sign OS version of this. And I don't want a thousand frames. I'm just going to put this back to where I had the project originally set, which was 400 frames. And I'm just going to save this to disk and I'll be back when this is done caching out. Okay, so that is done caching, and I'm realizing now that my animation kind of ends around frame 270, but I cached 400 frames of it. So if you need a little extra disk space, um, you know where to look for it, but I'm not that worried about it. I'm just gonna let it be. Um, I'm also gonna clean this up a little bit. I don't actually need this sphere anymore. I don't need this group or this point bop anymore. I'm just gonna kind of slide everything in nice order. I'm just gonna collapse this up here by hitting that little button right there and hit the P key so I can get a nicer layout here. Um, and I'm not gonna ever need this merge again, so I'm just gonna delete that. Next, let's add a little bit of noise to our pottery to give it some character. So I'm gonna just scoot this transform down a little bit and throw down an attribute noise. And wire that in right after our cache. By default, it's giving us color noise. We don't want that. I'm going to just set this vector to P for our position. It's giving us positional noise and it is way too much. So let's dial these settings back down. First thing is this is positive noise. I want it to be zero centered. And I just need to bring the amplitude way, way down. I think a value of 0 0.007 worked good for me. Now it doesn't look like much is happening here. I just need to increase the frequency a little bit. So I'm gonna decrease the element size and you can start to see that detail coming back. For my project, I'm gonna use a value of 0.4 and then I can actually adjust the individual X, Y, and Z scales a little bit. I want there to be a little bit more noise moving in the horizontal direction. So I'm going to just tap this button to bring up these extra fields here, and I can just scale it along the Y vector by a value of 0.1. And then you can really start to see these nice little pottery-esque ridges that we get here. I wanna use a different noise though. I found that I liked the way Perlin looked better for this project. So I'm just setting this to Perlin noise. And that should be pretty cool. Now, if I play back this spinning uh, animation, it does have like a feel of some pottery actually moving along. The next thing I'd like to do is say, be able to transition from a lumpier version of the pot to a smooth version of the pot. So we can do that using a wet map technique, which we kind of covered in the MFX modules uh, lesson two, I believe it was, module two. Um, but basically we can create a wet map based off of this pot spinning around and getting some mask from these objects that are in contact with it and using that mask to create an attribute that we'll use to not only drive how noisy this pattern is on our geometry, but also we'll use it when we're shading later on, switching between the two different clay shaders. So I'm gonna just bring in this outer stick here and we're gonna use that for our wet map. Let's go up here. I'm gonna just bring this down and throw down a blast. By default, this is just gonna delete both of those sticks. So I'm gonna actually turn my template flag off up here and put the template flag down here on our geometry for right now. Now, if I, if I have my blast, it's deleting everything. I'm gonna just select the inner. I just wanna remove the inner one and only use this outer one for our wet map here. The next thing I need to do is create a mask. So I'm gonna throw down an attribute an attribute create here. And the mask on our actual geo is gonna be initialized to zero. So I'm just gonna set this attribute to be mask and its value is initialized to zero here. And if I just bring this over on this side and set its value to one and then do an attribute transfer and transfer the mask from our second input onto the first input geometry. And we can see that uh, transfer happening here. If I click this I button and hit mask, you can see it's transferring that mask 
all over the geo. I'm going to just untick primitives and make sure we're only transferring in the mask attribute right here on the attribute transfer. And then I'll bring the blending options down. Let's bring the distance threshold way, way down to a value. Oops, I wanted my template flag back on here. Let's bring the distance threshold up to a value of say uh, 0.007 is good. And then we'll use a little bit of a blending width there as well. We'll bring this up to a value of 0.007 as well. So everywhere that this proxy geometry touches is going to get the mask, but it's not sticking. And we need to send this through a solver in order to get it to stick. So a basic wet matte solver, if you want more information about this, check out MFX modules, module two. But I will uh, just kind of throw this together real quick. We need a solver, wire that in and dive inside. I'm gonna throw it on a wrangle. I'm gonna bring in the first input, wire in the previous frame into the second input and wire the wrangle into the output and do a maximum test on my mask of attribute. So F at mask equals the maximum of our current mask and the mask that we're reading from the attribute on our second input. Jump back outside and click play. You can see that attribute is sticking to our geometry, but our geometry isn't actually spinning. So what I need to do is put this transform above our attribute create. Let's just bring the attribute create down and put the transform up here and rewind our solver and watch it again. And you can see here that the attribute is sticking as it's spinning around, but our pot is spinning too fast for it to fully fill in all these gaps. So we're getting these gaps here. And the way that I found to do that, we could increase the sub steps of the solver. We could say, make this three sub steps. And you'd see that it would be filling that in a little bit better, like so. But we can also help fill this in by kind of faking our geometry and stretching it out a little bit using a copy node. So let's start on a copy and wire it in after our mask. And here, if I highlight that and kind of look at our geometry and we increase the total number of copies to five and then just rotate along the Y axis by a little bit. See if I push that out, we're kind of like creating a little trail here that's gonna help us fill in those gaps. So I used a value of about two degrees here. And if we go back and play our solver now, this extra width here should help fill in those extra gaps that the sub steps in the solver didn't get on its own. And there you can see we're getting a nice even fill on our wet map. Great, so now let's actually use this to transfer uh, between, we'll transition between this kind of noisy version that we created with our attribute noise here and another version that's a little bit smoother. So I'm gonna throw it on a blend shape and we're gonna use this mask as our blend shape. So we're gonna start with the result of the solver coming in the first input. And then we're going to grab a smooth version of this from the second input, but we need it to be spinning. So we, we want to not apply noise, but we want to have the geometry spinning. So I'm gonna just alt drag this node over. You can see that this is this already was a reference copy of our previous node. So it's got all of the spinning channel references that we need. And I'm just gonna wire that into the output of our cache here instead. And then wire the result of this into the blend shapes node and highlight it. Now it's not gonna be doing anything because we need to turn on the blend masking here. We're just gonna switch this to set from attribute on the first input. And you can see that this all goes smooth. So if I rewind this, you can see that we're now transitioning between a lumpy version of the pot and a smooth version of the pot as it passes through here. Now I don't want this to fully resolve to a completely smooth pot. I want there to be a little bit of noise in there. So I might just remap my mask attribute so that it doesn't fully go to one. So over here, I'm going to throw down an attribute remap. And now I know that I want to actually use my map on a value of zero to one when we're rendering later on. So I'm actually going to rename this attribute to something else. So we're gonna start with our mask attribute and I'm just gonna rename this our blend attribute right here. And so when I make adjustments to this, I'm actually leaving my mask attribute intact and only changing this blend attribute for purposes of this blend shape. So I also need to update what I'm using as my blend mask attribute here. I need to switch this from mask to blend. And right now we should see nothing happen here. It should all be sort of the same. But if I go up here to my attribute remap and I change the output maximum to some lower value, you can see a little bit of that noise creeping back in. If I just bring this down to something like uh, 0.7, you can see a little bit of that noise creeps back into our pot. It's not as noisy as before, but it's just not fully perfect. So it keeps a little bit of that imperfection going on. So I'm going to actually turn off the mask visualization 
by uh, just clicking this little Google Maps icon. And I'm actually gonna also turn off the smooth wire shaded mode and just switch to smooth shaded mode and watch this play down in the viewport so I can kind of see the effect that that wet map is having without any masks in the way. So yeah, I think this is a good starting point where we can actually take this now and start to get it rendered. I'm gonna cache this out just so that we have it and things are a little bit more optimized. I'm gonna throw down one more file cache here. I'll call this the pottery blend cache. And again, I'm gonna take uh, the hip name out of the base name. So we're just left with dollar sign OS and I'm going to save this to disk. Now, when we do our motion blur later on, in Solaris, I'm going to want to have some extra sub steps in here in this cache. So I'm actually going to increase the sub steps to four and then I'm going to cache this out. And I will be back when that is finished. Now that that's done caching, I just need to give it a name. So I'm going to throw it on a name node, call it vase here in the name field, and then just throw it on a null. And I'm going to call this null capital vase. And now we can jump into Solaris for rendering. So I'm going to actually switch from the build to the Solaris desktop here. And if that doesn't pop you into the stage context, from this little menu right here, we just want, are going to want to click on this OBJ here until we get this drop down menu and then select stage. And now we're back over here in Solaris where we've got our stage laid out for us. Now that we're over here, let's bring in our pot. I'm just going to scoot up here to the top and do another SOP import to fetch that pottery. So the SOP path, I'm gonna select my little picker right here and go back up, close this, open up the pottery wheel and select the vase and hit accept. And then if I wire this into the merge, you can see our vase shows up right there in the middle of our scene. And if I hit shift R, I am now rendering this in Karma XPU at the moment. Now, if I hit the D key, you can see that my image resolution is set to a quarter just to kind of keep things a little bit fast. And I am using the XPU engine uh, based off of the render settings down here. If I switch over to viewport settings, you can uh, use this to switch between Karma CPU and XPU. Now, what I'm gonna do for the rest of this project is work in CPU mode because the blending mode for our material is not really gonna work in Karma XPU. So I'm actually going to switch to CPU mode in my display and I'm gonna also switch to the CPU engine on my render settings right here. If you're using Karma XPU in Houdini 20, it will be able to do this blending trick that we're only able to do in CPU mode for Houdini 19.5. So just a quick note about that. All right, so let's grab our materials now. If I bring up my GSG library, I'm gonna actually just show you the materials I like to use. I'm gonna to go to my library section here, and what I'm gonna be using is this Clay Fine Terracotta 1 and Clay Rough Terracotta 10, and also the Fiberglass Light Blue and the Cherry Unfinished 01. These are the materials that I'm gonna be using for my project. So now let's go through the import process. So up here I have the Grayscale Gorilla Shelf and if you don't have it or if you want to have your Grayscale Gorilla Shelf show up here, just go under Shelves and then down here to Grayscale Gorilla. And I'm just going to click Import Material. Now I want the, let's see, this Cherry Unfinished Clay Rough Terracotta 10. I'm just holding it on Control and selecting these. And Clay Fine Terracotta 1 and Fiberglass Light Blue. And I'm going to hit Accept. And here it's looking for the renderer. I want to grab, yes, Cherry and Fish. I want to check all these. And I want the renderer to be Karma. Good. And I'm going to say Import. And it's successfully imported those. Now, if I hop, it hops me over here to the matte context. And you can see I've got all my materials here. And uh, so we should be good to start importing these into our scene. So I'm going to just uh, hit the back button here, or you could go back to the stage context like this. I'm going to just import these real quick using a material library node. So let's throw on a material library, wire that in here. And now what I'm going to do is actually autofill materials from that mat net that we had before. So I'm going to select my material network, set it to mat and say accept. And then I'm going to say autofill materials. And you can see that that actually just adds all of those materials into our scene. And you can see that those materials have been added to our scene graph down here. See them all in there right there. This extra sweep is one that I created for the backdrop 
So um, that one was already created. I created that one before. But you can uh, now use this to assign the materials to our objects. So let's do that. The sweep, we want the background to be the sweep. So I'm going to grab the sweep and drop it in here. And the background should turn yellow. Then for the sticks, I want to assign the sticks to the cherry. So we got cherry unfinished here. I'm just going to drop the sticks in there. You can see that the sticks become uh, wooden colored. Then let's find the fiberglass. I want the table to be made out of this fiberglass material. So I'm going to drop that in there. And then the vase, I want to be this clay rough terracotta 10. So I'm going to drag this sop import. If we spin this up, you can see this one's called vase. I'm going to drag this sop import right here into clay rough terracotta 10 and it starts to look like clay. Now I just want to make a couple adjustments to these shaders. I'm going to just bring this back up and we're going to go back over to the matte context and let's start with the fiberglass. I didn't want there to be any subsurface here so I'm just going to go down and hit the Y key and slice through this scattering weight on both of those. So that's just more of a solid look there for the base. And then we need to adjust the clay. It's a little bit too big. So if I go over to this clay rough terracotta 10, you can see that there's some parameters up here on the top level of this node that we can use to conveniently change the scale of our texture. So what I did was a value of 0.4 and 0.4 in the X and Y. And if I kind of scoot in a little bit closer here and click the render region tool right here and just hold shift and drag a box, you can actually focus on just rendering this render region here. Um, you can click clear render region if you want it to go away, but I just kind of sometimes like to do that when I'm trying to focus on a certain area of my rendering. And this scale parameter, all these scale parameters are set up for us inside here. You can see that our texture coordinates are going into this transform and then the scale rotate and offset parameters are exposed here conveniently by the GSG plugin. So the next thing to do here is to actually bring in the other material and start blending between these two materials. So we're going to get the clay fine terracotta over here and drop that in. So let's dive inside the clay fine terracotta. And I just want to grab everything except for these two outputs. So I'm going to select everything except for the surface and displacement outputs and hit control C, then jump back over to clay rough terracotta. And let's just give ourselves some space and drop it down below. Control V. The next thing we need is a material X mix. So I'm going to zoom in here and hit tab and type mix. And we're going to use this material X mix node. And I'm just going to give myself some space here. We're going to wire in this first surface here into the background and then wire this into the output. And then uh, for our foreground, we're actually going to go down to our other standard surface here and choose that to be our output. So now if I select this material X mix and move this slider up towards one, you'll see that it adjusts to that other clay material. And we can actually drive this mix using a attribute, using that mask attribute. So let's bring that in. We need a node called the USD Primvar Reader. So USD Primvar Reader, and we drop that down. And the variable name we need is mask. So we just type in mask and wire that into the mix. And if I go to a frame where this transition is sort of in the middle of happening, um, about frame 120, you can see that we've got smooth material down here, and then we switch to our rough terracotta up here. Now we just need to hook this up for the displacement shader as well. So I'm going to bring this displacement up and off to the side. We're gonna hold down Alt and drag our Material X mix that we're using for the main shader. And then I'm just gonna hold the Y key and disconnect the foreground and background here. Then I want to wire the height of our rough terracotta into the background. And then let's grab the foreground port and bring it down here to our other displacement map and wire that into the out. And then let's come back up here and wire this into the displacement output. And so uh, you can't really see too much of a difference, but that's at least hooked up correctly now. And the only other thing I really did at this point was add a little bit of glossiness to make the rough terracotta appear to be more wet and then it kind of dries out as we mold it. So I'm going to just multiply down this roughness mat on the rough terracotta texture. And I'm going to do that just using a multiply. Material X multiply. Drop this down here and I used a value of about 0.6. And uh, yeah, you can see it's just added a little bit of glossiness there.
But that's essentially it. Karma, Material X, GSG Materials, all running in Karma. It's it's a, a thing to behold. And all these materials were just set up for us by this plugin. It's pretty cool. So I'm gonna jump back to the stage uh, here. And I'm gonna jump down here to my render settings. Now my render settings, if I hit the D key before we were using our viewport settings, I'm going to just switch this back to the default render settings node. So this is actually using the render settings node that we've created right here that is in our scene graph right here. So we're rendering using these render settings. And then I'm going to actually put the display flag on the motion blur and set it to two subframe samples. And you can see that that's streaking out our geometry is getting that nice rotational motion blur that we were looking for. Other thing that I don't believe I have addressed is that this dome light, it currently doesn't have a texture in it. So at this point, you would want to put in whatever dome light texture you'd like. Uh, in my case, I'm just gonna actually highlight it real quick so you can just focus on what effect this is having. Uh, maybe I'll drop my materials up here above my lights so I can actually see the effect that this dome light is having with my materials in the scene. I'm gonna bring these down a little bit. And here, I'm going to actually assign uh, GSG HDRI, one of my favorites, I'm gonna go here, open up my, uh, what is that? I got my GSG library here. I'm gonna select HDRIs. I'm gonna select this Pro Studios Metal HDRI. I use these all the time. And this will be kind of a nice base HDRI for our scene. And just hop back down here to our motion blur node and highlight that. And maybe let's look through our camera. From this drop down. I'm just gonna select camera one. And I'm gonna remove the render region. Uh, with this render region tool selected, I'm gonna say clear render region. And there we are. So from right here, if you wanted to render it out, you would just uh, grab your USD render wrap at the end here and say render to disk. To write all your files out to the location determined right here on your render settings. And that's it. So yeah, I uh, hope that you enjoyed this tutorial. I know there was a lot going on in there, but I thought it was pretty fun. And a super shout out thanks to GSG Plus for sponsoring this uh, tutorial. And I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.